The next part of the evening is a tribute to Ben Helfgott. Here as your host. Here as your host this evening, please do give him a huge round of applause. It's Judge Rob Rinder. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here to celebrate this extraordinary event tonight. And ordinarily, we celebrate all of the, as they're called, the boys and the girls that constitute our incredible family and go to build the fabric of this amazing annual simcha, where we all collectively and individually share in the joy, not just of survival, but of each other and of the third, and even here tonight, the fourth generations, and what an incredible triumph over adversity and every other meaningful thing each of the boys and the girls represent. <laughs> But just like Passover last week, why is tonight a little bit different? Because in nearly all nights, it's about all of the boys and the girls. But tonight, I love you too. <laughs> Thank you, Mum. Tonight is different because whereas we ordinarily share in the extraordinary experiences of all of the boys and the girls, tonight we honor and we celebrate the great chairman, our founding chairman, re-elected annually for 53 years, and now our honorary life president tonight, Ben Helfgott, this is your life. <laughs> Before we go down the journey of your life, how are you feeling, Ben? Would you like to say a few words? I feel very well. You feel well? Very well. Are you entirely confident that the people who are going to come and speak are going to say only nice and generous things about you? Well, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I'm very humble, and uh, I can't say it's what other people are going to do, but, but I uh, know that I was told that, that I would come and I shouldn't interfere and so on. <laughs> it's going to be an extraordinary evening. Everybody, please give our honorary president, Ben Helfgott, OBE, a round of applause. Please sit down. Our journey starts in the early days in pre-war Poland. You were born in Pabranice, Poland on the 22nd of November 1929. And you moved to Piatrakov six months later. You had a happy, loving and peaceful early childhood. And you happily attended the Polish secular school and Yesoda Hatora Cheda in the afternoon. You had very close parents, Moshe Yakov Helfgott and Sarah Klein, your two younger sisters, Marla and Louisa, and a large, tight-knit circle of grandparents, cousins, family, and friends. And tonight, she's here tonight, we invite your extraordinary sister and a sister to each and every one of us to the stage, Ms. Marla Tribic. Please come. My Yiddish man. What sort, of, what sort of brother was Ben when he was a little boy? Mischief? Well, he was a loving brother. He was a little lobos. 
he had lots of friends and, uh, and he was the leader. He was definitely the leader. He, uh, he loved ball games and sports and red and running and all sorts of things. A very, very active little boy. And love a thing. Yeah. <laughs> and what does it mean for you, explain to all us, for him to be honoured here tonight with a this is your life? What would you like to say? Well, I'd like to say it's well-deserved, of course. I am very, very proud of him. And I can't help thinking how his parents would have felt. But because I know the sort of upbringing we have had, and it is the early years where the foundations were laid, and that, the, that we have our parents to thank, that he is the man that he is because he came back from came from this loving united family and extended family and a very happy childhood it's a moment to remember yours and ben's parents ladies and gentlemen please give a round of applause to marla tribic as we hear from her now take a seat, take a seat over there Now, we move to perhaps the most, in fact the most, painful moment in Ben's life and all of our brothers and sisters who are part of this profound community that we share. 1939 to 1945, a journey that started in darkness and ended up here in a family out of bleakness to the UK. In 1939, you experienced the first German bombing of Poland whilst traveling home and, I think, visiting both of your grandparents. From then, nothing was the same. In November, you entered the Piotrkov ghetto with a number of other boys and stayed there for three years, working in the Hortensia glass factory alongside Krilik Wilder and, I have to say, my late grandfather, Overshalom. Your mother and sister, Louisa, were incarcerated in the synagogue and then shot in the forest. Your father remained with you and Marla was hidden. From October 1949, all but 2,000 of the 22,000 Jews surviving in the ghetto were sent to their deaths in Treblinka. But you, as they say, and as you describe so eloquently, was nothing more than lucky. In June 1945, you got a job in a wood factory until the 3rd of December 1944, when the cattle wagons took you to Buchenwald, and nine days later separated you from your father for the last time and sent you to Schlieben concentration camp, ultimately being taken to Theresienstadt before, liberate, before being liberated by the Russian army on the 9th of May 1945. And I know, having listened to the extraordinary account that you gave to Kirsty Young on Desert Island Disc, that in the last days, your father, may he rest in peace, never made it. Bad luck, as he described it. After liberation, Ben, you went to Prague and returned to Pryotrykov and Belsen to try, without success, struggled as you did to find Mahler. And on August the 15th, 1945, you left for Great Britain on RAF wings, one as we celebrate, experience in each other tonight of the 732 Jewish, mainly boys and girls, all under the age of 16, who had lost your parents, and who now, the Jewish Relief Organized Temporary, Rehabil organized temporary Re Rehabilitation vi Visas from the British government, makes you think about children and about refugees, as you've spoke so eloquently about. The boys. The boys, as you quickly became known, went to hostels across the, the UK. Your destination with 300 others was a hostel on the tranquil shores of Lake Windermere, which you described so eloquently in the past. And now as we turn to something fascinating, we've got some of the props on stage, so I think you know where this is going. Now before we do, as a barrister and now as a television judge, I always want to invite proof. So, See that little bell, barbell over there. Would you mind just seeing, doing your best, see if you can pick it up? The 250 kilos. I reckon you'll be all right. <laughs> Let's just see if you can do it. Everybody, would you just give him an encouraging round of applause? 
Jerry the Stone. I see I'm going to have to help him. Now. Just for the photo. <laughs> now, as we're going to discover, Ben Health got lifted a good deal heavier than that. He went to Plasto Grammar School and took 12 months to matriculate in English. Let's Think about that for a second, having missed six years in school. As Marla said, he was indeed a pretty clever young man. And he'd never learned the language. Nevertheless, he had an interest in economics and went to Southampton University. Think about not just the immigrants, but young Jewish person having come from that background. For his generation, the proportion that went on to university to study. His friends uh, remember him fondly, especially the barbell that he took with him and his passion for the pole vault. In fact, like so many of the boys, Ben loved sports and the camaraderie that flowed from competing. He enjoyed the time spent with the boys playing volleyball, table tennis, and football, first at Windermere and later at the Primrose Club under the guidance of the extraordinary Yogi Mare. You happened upon weightlifting in 1948 when you saw some young people lifting weights by the poolside. When you asked, Ben asked whether or not he could have a try, he stunned everybody. This is the stuff of real movies by clearing 180 pounds straight off. Now, think about that. That may not sound like a lot. It's half a meal at a Jewish grandmother's house, I would have thought. <laughs> But when you think about 180 pounds, think about this, that the British record at the time was only 30 pounds more than that. And when, as one of the boys, he arrived, having had no food, no nutrition, he became the national champion four times. In 1954, 1955, 1956 and 1958. He traveled back to the land of his birth in Poland in 1955 to take part in the World Festival of Youth, a time when Stalin was still the Soviet leader. And he, unlike a number of the other Western athletes, befriended a number of the European, Eastern European lifters and was able to speak to them in their own language. He won gold medals at the Maccabeah Games in 1950, 1953, and 1957, and won a bronze medal in the Commonwealth Games in Cardiff in 1958. And specially, and perhaps most specially of all, he competed for this, our great country. He describes himself as a complete, perhaps the complete, Anglophile. He competed for our country in the 1956 in Melbourne where he broke the Olympic record for the press lift and competed again in 1960s Olympics in Rome. Anybody that's... <laughs> Throughout this time, you made many friends with the other competitors and coaches, and so many of them became lifelong friends, including David Ride and Michael Mitzman, both of whom, I'm delighted to say, are here today. Now, the good news is if you listen to Ben when he took his one luxury item onto his desert island, what do you think he took? He said he wanted a weight and some barbells because that way he'd always be able to be fit. And in fact, his I want to say his obsession, but some might describe it as an addiction for fitness survives right up to this very day. Ladies and gentlemen, just watch this. Thank you. 
blood very early that to be very fit, every part of your body must be equally trained. As long as my body agrees with me and follows me, and so I do it. Human beings, they are creatures of habit. I am not different from anybody else. Very often, when I get up or during the night, I have a pain. All I say, oh my God, what am I going to do? I get up in the morning, I start training, it's gone. It's not magic. You, you, you move it. It's one of those difficult moments in Yiddish where you're not entirely sure whether to say oy vey or kanena horror. <laughs> now, after your extraordinary sporting achievements, you were restless to get on and earn a living. You left Southampton University in 1951, a trainee and then a manager at the famous Great Universal stores, which then became Dixon's Retail, and special projects before setting up Carina Sportswear in 1965. You manufactured dresses in the East End and then dressing gowns in Staffordshire, which supplied the high street. Your partner was the late George Kazan and his wife, Pan, who also worked at the heart of the business and knew you extremely well. Thinking back to the old days, the first things that come to mind are some funny stories about your legendary driving skills, having overshot the M1 exit reverse down the motorway, and the time that you went straight over a roundabout. But it was a little bit foggy that day. The time that you came out of the house in Hornsey Lane and crashed into the milk float. The funniest story that I can recall relating to the driving tales are the one when you came into the car park, the factory car park, which was completely empty except for one solitary vehicle and smashed into George's car. But more seriously, Ben, I would like to talk about the wonderful business relationship and personal association that you and George had for many, many years. You were well known throughout the Schmutter trade for your ability to always haggle a cheaper price for all your purchases. But more importantly, you're both well known for your honesty and integrity. An example of this is when Ben realized that a fabric supplier had grossly undercharged us for a delivery. Ben did not hesitate. He immediately contacted the supplier to inform him of, of the matter. And obviously the supplier was eternally grateful, especially when he found that other customers had similarly been un undercharged. Ben, however, was the only one who drew his attention to this matter. I have a deep affection and admiration for you, Ben, for all your various achievements, from your sporting prowess to all the good works that you have done over the years and still continue to do. While Ben earned a living supporting his family, he, of course, put great efforts into his family, to sports and to social life. He put back into his, our, all of our community right from the start, visiting the Lingfield children and Jerry Hertzberg and others, playing a leading role in the Primrose Club, and then instrumental in formally setting up this, our 45 Aid Society in 1963 first and foremost with the explicit mission that the survivors themselves were ready to look after those among them who faced greater challenges. And then after that, increasingly to support other charitable causes in both the UK and Israel. And perhaps there's no one better placed here tonight to appreciate and testify to the work Ben has done for his, our, 45 Aid Society, then ladies and gentlemen, he's here tonight, Harry Spiro.
Now, Harry, I know you're going to want to say a few words, but before you do, there are some words that you've already recorded, which we're going to watch now. I will say one thing about Ben. We come from the same town, we went through a lot of the same thing, but really and truly, looking back over the years, if it wouldn't have been Ben, his determination, his foresight, the, holo the 45 committee was, would never be in existence. We would never be what we are now, achieve so much thing, if Ben wouldn't have been our chairman for the last 35, 45 years. Ben was always a leader. He was always forward. He was in charge and took in charge of playing volleyball, so gymnastic. He was always doing something. Your father was a leader and he had something about him, acquiring knowledge. He was always interested in things. Very good memory. He read books when I didn't even know what a book was. <laughs> and he remembers it. Uh, he, your father is a very unusual man and a very intelligent man. I don't have to tell you, you know that. A very determined man. And once he feels uh, that the object is right and he feels strong about it, no one can stop him. And he does achieve it. And he has achieved. No, he's a very... Anyway, people might think I like him. <laughs> Thank you so much, Harry. Now, is there anything, as I always say at the end of cases, that you'd like to add? Well, it looks like I've said everything already. <laughs> Ben, I will only say to you, I remember how the 45 started. Basically, when we were meeting up in different, par different parts, the Holocaust survivors, and very often, but in, in small groups. And you came up w with a very, very good idea that we should become a, a society. Hence, you, you, rec you, you s registered it, sorry, you registered it, and hence it was the 45 Aid Society. That's how it started. Another thing that comes to my mind, you know, whenever we all, you organized our reunions, it was very, very important, very nice. One of those days when we decide, when we were talking about um, who should be our speaker and who in, we should invite different guests, and we couldn't agree on uh, who should be invited and who should be the guest speaker went on for a long time. You could see that it's going to take a long time. And you said, wait a minute, boys. What about if we invite a prime minister? <laughs> and we said, what? It's nice if you can get it. And of course, you did get it. Ben, this was the first time that you actually invited a prime minister to our function, and that was 40 years ago. His name was, for this pipe smoker, Wilson, Harold Wilson. Harold Wilson. <laughs> that was, and that was really amazing thing to do. You were only a young man. Over the years, I've been looking what you have achieved. And I come to conclusion that a man, a young man you were, you actually invite, you, you got 
friendly with the last three prime ministers, develop a good relationship with them, in particular with uh, the last one, with Cameron, and the relationship you actually developed and the commitment that the government actually committed to you think that the Holocaust should never be forgotten. And one man should do that with three prime minister. Ben, I salute you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now how, thank you, Harry. And now how perfect as we turn to the next extraordinary part of your life all of the education and so much of the legacy that you've left on behalf of this, not just our family, but into the reaches of beyond to an extent that perhaps all of us here can't fathom. Because long before it was, it was accepted as the thing to do, you encouraged the boys and the girls across the world of the importance, the critical importance of speaking out to remember the Holocaust and to teach, to share in its lessons. Here you are, Ben, more than 35 years ago, with a message we all, all of us recognize as so distinctly yours. Dad, can you first explain why you think it is so important to talk about the Holocaust? We all believe that the time has come that those so the survivors, and here I'm talking about the youngest survivors, of uh, whom uh, my sister and I are amongst the youngest survivors, because children were, in actual fact, uh, the first ones singled out for destruction. So uh, from this point of view, it is important that we keep talking about it. We, li we leave a living memorial, a living legacy to the younger generation that they could continue to tell the world that this has happened. We must never tire in talking about it, however painful it is to us, for the very reason that we owe it to the dead. We owe it to our parents who did not survive. We owe it to our brothers and sisters who did not survive. And if we have to carry their memory. Nobody knows how we feel and what we think about it, because it is our loss. And we do not want to subject the whole world to it, but the world must know that such a thing happened, and the world must know that such a tragedy, such a catastrophe, must be prevented, irrespective where it is and who it is. Because a Jewish story is not just a Jewish story. A Jewish story is a story of mankind, and we are part of mankind. And we must not allow mankind to be brought into this kind of abyss that has happened to me in my childhood. And this is something incredibly rare. There he you are with Ludovic Kennedy on the BBC contributing to a debate. This was a debate about the Northern Ireland Troubles. Ben was invited to come and speak to all of us, the people watching television then, and the subject of the discussion was justice, justice. Here's Ben, underlying the importance of both securing justice and, above all, his message, being tolerant and humble. Yes. It's a very, very thin line. Uh, I mean, uh, Ben has raised such an interesting point here. In the final analysis, justice is what our society stands on. And irrespective of what we think or how we feel, society still has to defend itself against perpetrators. Recognizing what Ben has said, in his tradition, you see, there is doing justly, as Micah says, but also loving mercy. You just took out the word of my mouth without going to quote Micah, uh, in, in that he said that to do justice, to love, to love mercy, and walk humbly with God. When you talk about justice, justice has to be tempered with mercy. Can I just say this? You, you are, I think, to a certain degree unique, and I think Gordon's unique, too. We, we all respond differently. Yeah. And we don't know how we will respond no. un, 
until it until happens, it happens right. of course. That, that is why it is presumptuous of any one of yes. us to talk about something that hasn't happened to them. Right. Only the people to whom it happened, they, they, they at least have got the, uh, the right, if, 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 yes. if, if there is such a right, because they can, they, again, they cannot even speak for the dead. Yeah. The Red Book that we'll be presenting you with tonight, Ben, contains tribute after tribute from national and international organizations, a number of whom lead in the field of Holocaust education and remembrance. And there are many of them, many of them here tonight, and many who could not be here who would like to make a tribute. But we do have something quite extraordinary. Um, we have Suzanne Barget, head of Suzanne Barget, head of budget, head of research at the Imperial War Museum. We're thrilled this evening to have Dame Helen Hyde, the UK National Holocaust Commission and headmistress of Watford, Watford Grammar School. Karen Pollock, OBE, chief executive of the Holocaust Education Trust. Ruth Ann Lenger, head of academic programs at university. Uh, head of university, excuse me, head of academic pro programs at University College London Centre for Holocaust Education, and Olivia Marks Waldman, CEO of Holocaust Memorial Day. Can I invite you all, they're all here tonight, as Eamon Andrews would say, to come and be counted for Ben. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is something of an unprecedented treat. Five of the leading ladies of the Holocaust Education Trust and various other organizations will now take to this floor to perform a song in homage to Ben. You may be more used to seeing them take, taking groups of students to Poland, conducting research, teaching the teachers, or indeed leading memorial events, but tonight, for you, and boy would they only do this for you. For one night only, these are quite literally the Supremes, not those Supremes. The Supremes of their field will perform their debut single, so please, ladies and gentlemen, stand up, give a round of applause for Olivia, Suzanne, Karen and Ruth Ann with a song, There Is No One Quite Like Ben. Take it away, girls. There is no one quite like Ben. No one in the world. We are confident, strong women, we strategically can lead. We are capable of toughness, governments and policies. When we're asked to take on too much, we'll say no to anyone. Except, of course, our dear friend Ben. <laughs> has energy that makes us all exhausted just to see he's at number 10 so often they have cut him his own key flights to new york and to europe and at every embassy we all admire his tenacity there is no one quite like
have to do all this and stay in check. She's called Asa. <laughs> there is a point like this. Ladies and gentlemen, join no. in. Gentlemen, the Supremes. Brilliant. Those extraordinary women, leaders in their field, all individually at some point came up to me this evening and said they would quite literally only have ever done that for you. Now we turn to your extraordinary con contribution beyond the reaches of our community. Over the years, Ben's open, driven, and determined efforts have won a huge number of friends and influenced people well beyond our community and across the world, nationally as well. The ambassador, His, Excellently, His Excellency Witold Solvko of the Republic of, from the Republic of Poland, is here tonight to pay tribute to you. What could not be here tonight to pay tribute to you, but has written in the book that you will receive that you are one of the most inspirational people he has ever met, one of the most positive, bright, open-minded, and tolerant people he knows. He also talks, and I've read it, of your incredible Polish and of your background and of everything you've done to build bridges, both with that country and for young people to go and visit it. And he hopes that as a president of the society, you will be an activist, you are. A fighter, you are. And a fighter for a better tomorrow. And in a phrase full of positive meaning to anyone with the historical perspective, the complex and difficult history of Poland and her Jews, his Excellency says this, that you, Ben, are one of the best ambassadors Poland has ever had. Now we turn to Sir Eric Pickles. Sir Eric Pickles first met Ben when he served in the cabinet as, I have to say, particularly as far as our organization and others are concerned, a great Secretary of State at the Department for Communities and Local Governments. And as they said back then, Ben, Sir Eric is here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Eric Pickles. Thank you. I'm actually uh, still in shock having seen that wonderful performance, <laughs> which even now is trending on Twitter. <laughs> now, my friends, you, you just know me as a chap who doesn't carry any cash in his pocket, but um, I'm very proud to say I'm a friend of Ben's. I first met him uh, through, uh, through work, and in common with just about anybody who is anybody, uh, in politics in the United Kingdom, in Poland, in Israel, in the United States, we all know Ben. Ben is not just a consummate networker, someone who can persuade, well, can persuade uh, some people to perform a very interesting song, but, <laughs> but can persuade people to engage, and he does it by process of his personality. Is such an engaging guy. Now, I, to me, Ben, if you don't mind me saying, you kind of symbolize more than anything the boys and the survivors. We rightly think, and events this week has made us think rightly about all those people who died, all those people who could have been here 
this evening with their children and with their grandchildren celebrating life. But to me, you symbolize those who came here, went through that dreadful experience, started a family, started a business, and put something back into the United Kingdom. I have absolutely no doubt that Great Britain is a better place, Ben, because of all the work that you've done, and I'm very proud. But I'm proud for another reason. This is a selfish reason. I actually only know two Olympians. One is Seb Coe, <laughs> and, you're the, and you're the second one. I used to get quite a kick. Um, when we had the Olympics, I used to get quite a kick of introducing us, our, 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 um, our, our Olympian here to represent, uh, represent uh, uh, the community. But I got a little, I mean, we, we saw the, uh, the film, which was terrific, uh, but I personally got a bit of an insight into your prowess at the last um, uh, Holocaust Memorial Day. We had this big uh, shindig at... Uh, at Downing Street, which Tim was out, and the Prime Minister turned up, and a lot of the great and the good turned up, and we were all very pleased with ourselves. And then Ben offered me a lift um, in his car to the Guildhall. So we wander down Downing Street, which actually is quite a long street, and we get to the bottom, and Ben says, I've forgotten my, uh, I forgot, I forgot my mobile phone, I'll just go get it. And I'm just beginning to form the words in my mouth. Oh, Ben, I'll go get it for you if you like. And he's shooting <laughs> up Downing Street. And at that point, it's beginning to accelerate a little. He comes, he gets the thing from, uh, from the door and then accelerates down. And I'm, I thought, well, God, who does it remind me of? And I thought, well, a slightly smaller Eugene Bolt. <laughs> I think it was only because of the time he didn't sort of drop down on one knee and do, do the vaults uh, uh, fair, but victory, uh, uh, victory. And we get into the car, and he says to the driver, you remember this, uh, he said, step on it, we're late. <laughs> but Ben, I'm really proud to know you. I'm really proud to call you a friend. And the difference you've made on the foundation, with the, the trust and the foundation. You know, pretty soon we are going to build that monument next to the House of Parliament to the Holocaust. And it's going to be a thing of wonder and light and memory and defiance. And a lot of it, my friend, comes down to the hard work that you've done. So my dear friend, great to be here. <laughs> Now, no matter what your achievements, no matter what your interests, ultimately the most important thing in your life and the most important opinions are of your family. Ben, Arza, and your family have always been your number one, your number one love and your priority. And I remember listening to you giving an interview not long, in fact, before I chose, chose to get married. And you spoke about Arza. And you said, after numerous decades of marriage, that you loved her even more now than the first day that you met her. Words that were inspiring to me and to anybody who chooses to get married. Thank you, Ben. Now, let's hear the most important voices in your life, what your grandchildren have to say. Is it really close up on our face? I don't like too close up on my face. Brave, 
He's very brave and strong. Strong, very strong. Um, um, he's also very courageous, but it's yeah. a bit brave. But. He's quite short, but he's quite muscly, so he's built out. He's bold. His face is quite round, but he's always smiling. He's quite short. Yeah. He's quite short. He's bald, like all of our parents. He's bald. The three sons are also bald. And he smiles quite a lot. And and he is very strong. Yeah. He tells me to read a lot and yeah, just practice. If we have a chat with him, we have to come really close very to his close. face. Like, so. Um, yeah, like the football score was good, and like <laughs> sometimes you see like a serious side of him, but yeah. when he's always so proud of us. And he has a ginormous breakfast, <laughs> like that big. Yeah, he is quite stubborn. He I'm is. quite stubborn, I guess. It's not good enough unless it's the best. So he'll always ask me, "Where did you come in the class?" For example, I was—I remember, I—he was the first person I rung when I got my GCSEs. And I said to him, I said, you know, I got six A stars. And he said, what happened to the other four? He didn't even say, he didn't, he, you know, he said, well done but afterwards. You know, but the first not, thing he said was, what happened to the other four? Because yeah. we know it's coming from a place of love. It's because he wants yeah. the best for us. And that's what I love about him. Cranberry, special K, <laughs> and raisins, apricots, uh, loads of milk. Nuts. Yeah, he eats very slowly. He is quite amazing and has a good story. Growing up, I've always known about how he's a Holocaust survivor, how he was a weightlifter. I didn't realise how good he was at weightlifting and I also didn't realise that it was so amazing how he was a weightlifter after this tragic event. I didn't, you know, I didn't pick up on how, you know, how inspirational and how brave he is to do that and how, what a courageous man he is. I just thought of him as grandpa. He's yeah. quite famous. Yeah, well, kind of. Yeah. Well, he's in a few books and yeah. he used to be in the newspaper. I think he is quite a special grandpa because of what happened to him. Um, I don't think that Many grandpas were in the Olympics and in the war and all survived it. It's a huge thing to be strong inside and out because someone may, a weightlifter or a bodybuilder may be strong on the outside, but really on the inside they can crumble. Or, you know, the other way around, how someone may be very strong inside, but not so strong on the outside, which doesn't matter as much. But, you know, it's very special to have a really special quality to be strong inside and out. What's the next question? Gentlemen, welcome Ben and Arthur's extraordinary grandchildren to the stage. And now, for so many of us, the second, third, and even fourth generation, and as Ben so often speaks about, the future. This book is full of the most moving tributes, but perhaps the most touching are the many words from the children and the grandchildren of the boys who have been influenced by your message and who have reached out their arm and from you taken on the baton, the extraordinary thing that we see tonight and accepted it because it was you who thrust it into each of our hands. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome tonight, Angela Cohen, Chairman, Kim Stern, Secretary, Philip Burton, Vice Chairman, and Alan Greenberg, the Treasurer of the 45A Society. by Trevor Avery and Rosewood to Windermere to mark the 70th anniversary of the arrival of 300 young Holocaust survivors 
who were liberated from the camps of Eastern Europe to the Lake District to begin their recovery. Group economy class tickets were bought and 35 of us met at Euston Station ready for our trip. Out of the blue, two very nice young women in Virgin Rail uniforms approached me and asked me if we were the 45A Society group. I said yes. And then they said how thrilled we were that we were travelling with them and how delighted they were to give us an upgrade to first class both there and back. Tea and coffee would be served, followed by lunch with wine. We all followed these young ladies into a plush carriage, wondering how all this had happened. Suddenly, Ben appeared with a big smile on his face. I phoned the train company, he said yesterday. I spoke to a very nice man and told him why we were going to Windermere, and he was so interested. Ben, just another example of how, what an incredible effect you have on everyone you come into contact with, whether it be a prince, a prime minister, or just a nice man from a railway company. <laughs> Ben, a couple of words, if I may. We've heard a lot tonight that Ben is persistent. Persistent is definitely the word. I would say, Ben, you are persistent. And you have for many, many years told us, told me, told Angela, that we must, and I repeat, must, take over from the survivors. And Ben, your persistence has paid off. In fact, without you, and without your encouragement of us, the second generation wouldn't be where we are today. And Ben, all I can say, I think we would say, that we hope that you will be as proud of us as we think many people in the room are of you tonight. I have a little gift for you from my beautiful wife. This is some of the original artwork from the memory quilt, and it is a map of Poland with inscribed the 330 names of the boys and it's on the memory card over there. This is an original artwork, and it's for Ben. Steve, Steve. <laughs> now we turn, all of us, as we do each year to this organization, our brothers and sisters, Ben's brothers and sisters, the family that he created, the charity that he inspired, the community and the simcha that brings us all here together, whose energy emanates from here and spreads its message of light to disinfect those who would come to seek, to deny the memory of the Holocaust. Your light, your extraordinary light, shines like a beacon on, from all of us to the rest of the world. And with that light, I invite, as we do each year, all of the survivors, the boys and the girls, the second generation committee, and of course, they say behind every great man is a great woman. In your case, she stood by you side by side, the great Aza Helfgott. I invite you all to the stage, please. Now. As you all standing, I invite you all to stand. 
I'm left with only one thing to say. It is my honor, my privilege, my pride on behalf of each and every standing person here, on behalf of this community and beyond, to say to the extraordinary, the inspirational Ben Healthcott OBE tonight, this is your life. Survivor's photo, keep the music running. All the boys join Ben and all Arthur boys on stage for the Survivor's photo. photo. Ben would like all the boys to join him and let's turn up the music. We are family. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, your daddy. Ben would like to say something. Living life is fun and we just begun to get our share. 